Welcome to the October 24th meeting of the Rotary Club of Jamestown. I ask that we begin with a moment of silence as we remember Rotarian Lucy Miller. Let's remember Lucy and her family in our prayers. Lucy was a wonderful person, a great Rotarian. She made our Mondays brighter with her music and smile. And every time I came to a meeting and she was here, she always made me feel much better. And our meetings haven't been the same without her playing alongside of us. We all, we all miss her and her music very much. Um, the Rotary Board is making a memorial donation with personal funds to the Little Theater and Thanksgiving. Thank, thanks for the gift of music that Lucy gave to the club. So if anybody would like to participate in that, just see me today or, or next, next week. So please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, singing the national anthem and repeating the four-way test. Let's repeat the four-way test. The things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build, build goodwill and better friendship? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Our invocation today is given by Tim Edberg. Quick story about Lucy. Um, many of you here <clears throat> knew her better half of 25 or 30 years. Gonna miss her dearly. Um, when we were meeting at the Jackson Center, um, Lucy got gotten a little older, of course, and she had, had a little mobility issue getting from piano to the food and back. And I'd ask her, would you like me to get you a plate? And, never wanted me to do that and uh funny part about it is she would play the national anthem before getting her food so she had a certain amount of time to get her food and get back to play the song right and i'd always be like is she gonna make it is she gonna make it and you know there's a couple of times she almost didn't but she made it every time but the, the real thing i want to say is i would sit in her direct line between when she finished piano playing and went and got her food. And every time she would, and she knew I did, she would go by, touch my shoulder and say hi, or I would say hi to her every day, every Monday. And uh, that made my day. Love her dearly, miss her. Please bow your heads. Lord, we are thankful for this day that you have given us for its blessings, its opportunity, and its challenges. May we appreciate and use, use each day that comes to us. We pray for strength and guidance for each day as it comes, for each day's duties and for each day's problems. May we be challenged to give our best always, and may we be assured of your presence with us. Lord, it is good to recognize the different talents you have given us, as well as our dreams, our backgrounds, and our occupations. It is also good to know that when you created each of us, you broke the mold. No one is exactly like anyone else. 
Yet, we thank you that we can take these talents and mobilize them for the good of Rotary and our community, as did our fellow Rotarian, Lucy Miller. Thank you for these talents. Thank you for her talents. And bless us as we meet together and remember. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Please welcome President elect Wilson and Dean to announce our visiting Rotarians and guests. Thank you so much, John. So today we have visiting us David Niles. Where did you wind up sitting, David? There he is, there, back over in the corner. Welcome. Uh, we also have Emily Kama, uh, mother of uh, Yoa this, this month. And also a prospective Rotarian. So please get to know her. And the better half of the Troxel family. Hi, Marissa. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. Announcements. Um, our Rotarily Yours recorded today is Eric Harvey. As always, many thanks to you and the Communications Committee. Today is World Polio Day, October 24th. We've helped reduce the number of polio cases in the world by 99.9% .9 in the past three decades, but we've made tremendous progress. But as the recent news reminds us, the fight's not over. Um, golf update. We raised 7,514 from the golf tournament, uh, which is pretty good, all things considered. Thank you to the committee and all those that participated and donated towards the golf tournament. And next year, we're moving the tournament up to July 17th, where it traditionally was. So we got that confirmed with Moonbrook, which is a good thing. End of August, it gets a little late. Um, Rudy, I believe you have an announcement online. Hi, yes, I do. Can everybody hear me okay? Hey, hey, now we can't hear you, Rudy. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay, try one more time. How about now? Is this good? We Thumbs up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so I want to share uh, right away to save the date. Tuesday, November 15th is the Go Global Fair here at JCC in the Student Union. Um, I will send out uh, an exact itinerary of times, but so far we have most of the day covered from 9 a.m. until 2 p.m. with different events happening, but you are welcome to attend for free. Um, we're looking into panelists uh, discussions with our international students. Um, also having panelists with um, persons with experiences uh, from uh, abroad, um, namely David Troxel and Marissa Troxel to come talk about their experience as well as um, a performance to close the event. But you will also have a two hour block to visit with uh, a lot of our international students who will be setting up their own tables, representing their country, their culture, and uh, all of us will be there to celebrate. So save the date, November 15th, here at JCC campus, um, all day event for a Go Global Fair. Thank you. Thanks, Rudy. Additional announcements, Ruth. Very good. So um, just a reminder, tomorrow uh, via Zoom is a remote meeting at noon uh, to talk about fundraising. We are interested in anybody who's, who has any input you want to give, whether there's a fundraising event that we've had that you'd love to see us do again, whether there's a fundraising event we've had that you hope we never will do again, whether there is a new and different idea. Um, if you attend tomorrow, it does not mean you're locked into the fundraising committee. It just means we're getting some very valuable feedback from our membership. So please 
It's been so long since we've been able to do a real fundraising event. I encourage everybody to join us. It'll be tomorrow at noon via Zoom. And you can ask Kevin Six or myself. If you, um, whoever, wh whoever's on Zoom and you can muted, please mute yourself. Okay, thank you. So, so that I just really want to encourage everyone to come on board and, and say what it is about fundraising that you would like to participate in um, that would get you excited. So we want to get back on track. Um, coming up, I hate to, I don't like to think about it, but it's November next week. Okay, so two good things in November. Tuesday, November 1st at noon is the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee meeting. Noon, it's a hybrid. It can be either at CRCF or by Zoom. If you're interested, please let me know. Thursday, November 3rd, is the next Vision Committee meeting. Also at noon, also a hybrid via Zoom or at the CRCF. So two meetings coming up uh, next week, the first and the third at noon. Um, so. Uh, Sherry, I don't know if you wanted to talk about drivers and exchange week. If you have any updates, I was just going to remind people that we need drivers. Um, uh, we don't know the exact time yet, but December 2nd through the 4th for the for YOA and the uh, folks in um, uh, the, the exchange student in Fredonia to get up to Buffalo. We don't have specific times. But we'd really like to have a pool of people who would be interested in driving. So if that's something you might be interested in doing to help out with the exchange program, please let Sherry and myself know. And as soon as we have specifics, we'll let you know. Does that answer your question, David? Thanks, Ruth. I have a couple of other things for youth exchange, if that's OK. Can hey, you hear me? On. David was going to ask a okay. question. The Zoom meeting, the link, link I can send it to you or Kevin can send it to you. It was sent last week. Okay, I'm sorry, Sherry, go. No worries. Um, so just so you know that uh, we are now currently accepting applications for next year's exchange. I have talked to someone at Maple Grove and I've talked to someone at Southwestern and let them know and sent them our posters. I've requested that we could have an in-person meeting, but I haven't heard back from them yet. We tentatively have the application due date as November 4th, and we want to do um, interviews. Actually, I think we confirmed the date of the interviews for, I can't remember, Chris emailed me. I think we said Wednesday and Thursday, the 16th and 17th. We'll let you know for sure. But if you know anybody that's interested and needs a preliminary application, I can send it to them. I've also been approached by the district um, Liz O'Connor, O'Connell or O'Connor said she might be interested in speaking to someone. So we're trying to stimulate interest in applications for next year. So if you know of anybody, please let me know. Okay, while I'm doing that, I have from last week, we had a wonderful presentation from Striders about the mentor program. And I've still got some of the uh, application forms. So if anyone's interested, uh, didn't pick one up last week, weren't here last week, um, or saw it on, on Zoom and wish they could have gotten a copy. I have them. I had the pleasure of worshiping on Sunday with Soren's mother, and his sister performed a violin with our choir. Wonderful performance. But Soren's mother said he is having the time of his life in France and says hi to everybody. He's sending pictures to her, so she's going to pass them on to us. And he also is an accomplished violinist and has taken his violin to France and is having a great time entertaining the French people. Thank you, Ruth. Please get your tickets ready as we welcome Deb Kathman for today's 50-50. Thirty-eight to the winner. 
39 to the winner. Three, two, three, seven. Three, two, three, seven. The Troxels, big winner. Give a hand to our Sergeant at Arms, Doug Conroe. Okay, so we have a pot somewhere. Debbie, where'd she go? Um, yep. So, we're gonna sweeten it here. Uh, Amy has to leave early, and uh, Jim is very appreciative of the club and is very happy with it. So, we're gonna help here, and I've got another donor that I didn't write down. Hmm. In any case, I do not have people to recognize today, although I, I should recognize Tori because she is reminding me of an announcement I need to make. And that is, no, well, you could. I want to put everyone on notice that has not connected about your name badge to do so with our new name badge coordinator, Ms. Myers, because there are a large number of Rotarians that have not confirmed whether their badges have the correct classification name under them. And there may be people that just don't have them yet. And she needs to bring this project to a conclusion. So next week, she'll be giving me a list of people who have not checked in with her to get things going. And we will look forward to their participation here. So we're, everyone's on notice for a week. Let's get these name badges taken care of and where they need to be done. And thank you. Um, in this month's Rotarian Magazine, uh, Sue probably noticed all the polio information. I think as she mentioned at birthday table. I thought it was interesting, the millions of dollars and how they had a pie chart that shows how your donation goes. So uh, they're still spending 12.7 million on detection. And as we're seeing in New York City and elsewhere, that's money that needs to be spent. How much, and there's a new strain, so there's research. So Sharon, how much do you think they're spending on research? Million, two million, five hundred thousand? How? How? How much do you think out of the? Give me close. One of those. Close is good. One million, one point three million. They're currently spending on research. Wow, that's all. Well, they're spending 10.9 on experts. No, you don't have to because you were close enough. And what are they spending more money on? Public awareness or actually vaccinating people? Becky, you're, you look very pensive. What are they spending more money on? A public awareness or vac actual vaccinations? You got it. A million dollars more to public awareness than to actual vaccinations. Although if you add the cost of the vaccine in, then the vaccinations covers it. So it's just kind of interesting things. I mean, $53.6 million the foundation is spending on awareness and 52.7 on actually vac vaccinating. So that's good. Uh, it is football season still. I welcome John with sadness. I couldn't note for last week, but John told me he's 
since he's not been here, he'd like to catch up for Penn State. Uh, we have some others. Uh, I think we have a Michigan grad in the room. Uh, Kentucky, Ithaca, we have a Cortland grad in the room. I suspect we have uh, for everything. Ooh, thank you. We, we like different president's pictures on those. Wow. Ooh. Uh, well, I think we have a Mount Union grad in the room. Uh, John Carroll, Mullenberg, we may have on the on the tube, I'm sure, our 100% attendee, Mullenberg. Brockport, Cincinnati, and thank you. Mr. President, perhaps there are some happy bucks? Happy bucks. I'll get started. Um, Saturday was Pedal for Polio, organized by Kevin Sigsby. And we had uh, Chris Anderson out there, and I think Greg Jones was on an e-bike as well. It's and about four others for a total of seven or eight people. So just want to give thanks to those guys getting out there for the Pedal for Polio fundraiser. I think we've raised about 1,250 so far with a goal of 2,000. So thank you for everybody that got out there. Um, I had the opportunity to attend the Retool Western New York 2020 conference this past week and cheers to the Jamestown BPU. They did a fantastic job. The speakers were awesome. The location was great. We had some really great networking. If they do it again next year, hopefully they will. Um, I re really recommend that you attend. Um, thank you, Courtney. That was what I was going <laughs> to say that the Retool uh, 22 conference went really, really well, and the Small Business Development Center was the major sponsor of the event. So um, also Dan Heitzenreiter helped a lot with publicity uh, through the chamber. Schultz Auto Group was there uh, for the EV showcase, we called it, and uh, the Community Foundation and JCC were involved in getting the word out. But Courtney, uh, thank you so much for your strong sponsorship. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is, uh, since Andrew Hill's here, I was listening to the radio on Saturday and heard a repeat of an interview with uh, Vince Horgan and Russ Dietrich was on there and you were on there and that was very good. And I also missed last week. So there you go. Uh, I've got five happy bucks. Um, Lou and I survived our first major RV road trip to Louisiana and Arkansas. Beautiful, beautiful. We did quite well. Um, you know, so I missed a meeting, missed a literacy meeting. And I have a dollar in there for Andrew Hill, too, because my husband said, please make sure you say hi to Andrew for me. Because Andrew also interviewed my husband, Lou, when he retired. Yeah, Andrew and Russ. So. All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. I have a fantastic volunteer opportunity for you. Have you ever wanted to bag groceries at Wegmans? Bagging groceries is back for United Way after a two year hiatus. If you're interested all throughout the month of November, we have multiple times. If you want to sign up, the best thing you can do is take out your phone and text scan volunteer to 41444. I will also send a link, maybe if that's easier for people than taking out their phones and texting scan volunteer to 41444. Um, and you can just sign up for a time that way. It's a lot of fun. It's one hour. You bag groceries, you wear a Live United shirt, and that sort of reminds people when they go to the register. Uh, during the next month at Wegmans to donate to United Way. You can round up. Better yet, you can donate $5. And then the cashier gets like a prize if they get the most. So I always like to donate $5 so that the cashier is sort of entered into the running for that. So it really is a lot of fun. Um, most people, like people beg me to do it. That's, I mean, it's very exclusive. So um, encourage everybody to take a turn because it's actually like a great fun. And, and actually it's like playing Tetris too. Like you're looking at the stuff coming down. It's like, how do I bag this? So it's an enjoyable hour.
Uh, and Saturday, I did something that I thought I should do, and I finally did it. So I, I signed up to go on the 27-mile bike ride for Polio Plus. And uh, so thank you for past president Kevin for putting that together. Thank you to Jake from the CRCF who got my bike down there on his bike rack. So there we are off with some other nice Rotarians and some different clubs and uh, people that weren't in Rotary. And we took off and we got to the first hill. And I, I don't know why I was ahead, but I was. And I, I said, well, I'm going to go up the hill. I don't want to get embarrassed. So I went up the hill and then I got to the top. I looked behind me. And they were still mostly down towards the bottom. You mean at my age? It's called an e-bike, and I had a great time. This, this community, as Tim says, has so many wonderful, talented people. And on Sunday, one was honored, and that was Helga Hulse. And there was a concert at First Lutheran, which if you haven't even just walked in there and sat with the sunshine coming through the stained glass windows was so moving anyway. And then all of our talented organists and pianists began playing and the bell choir and the choirs. And we are bless Helga Hulse for all that she gave. She was a musician who trained musicians, but God bless the musicians that are still here because they were fantastic and they honored her beyond belief. I've got a dollar for Lucy. Certainly she, she touched so many lives and we all have a lot of stories and we'll just keep her close to our heart always. And my other dollar is for our speaker today. It was July 23rd, 1986, that I assumed a position with Quality Markets and Sales. And the very first day, the phone rang and Merrill Rosen was on the other end. And that began a uh, unbelievable relationship with Quality Markets and, and the Media One stations. And that has continued a variety of ways. Uh, Andrew still lets me come up and put a little spot on the radio there occasionally. And Andrew, I can't thank you enough for what you do. You provide so much for our community with that radio station. I tell you, I don't know what my morning would be if, if I didn't listen to Dennis Webster and Terry Frank. So so this is my first happy buck since becoming a Rotarian. I had no choice because the other three immediately jumped off the out of their chairs to come up, and I didn't want to be the only one left at the table, but I have missed a few meetings, so. Uh, have you ever gone to an event and it just wasn't what you were expecting? I mean, that happened to me a week ago Saturday. I went to the highway cleanup and I was pretty confident because it was raining. So I figured I'd just show up, you know, pretend to be a dedicated Rotarian. They'd cancel it and I'd be on my way. But no, there were like 15 people that showed up and they were like actually determined to pick up the highway. And Vince Horgan, you know, insisted that we get out there. So I figured, well, that's all right. I'll take an easy section. And wouldn't you know it? I got teamed up with Doug Conroe. And Doug goes, oh, man, I wrenched my back the other day. I can barely walk. And I'm like, oh, please, Doug. I mean, you know, I was just going to wander aimlessly for a little bit. So and then eventually a car pulls over to rescue me. It's driven by Pat Kinney. She said, are you about done? And I noticed her car's empty. I said, where's everyone else? And she goes, oh, they're still working. Thanks, Pat. So anyway, uh, very proud of all of our fellow Rotarians, not me, but very proud of all of our fellow Rotarians for a great job. Thank you. And I got, a, I got one more for Andy, who just gave me $11 to give us a even, even $7,525 for the golf tournament. So. Thank you, Andy. Do any Rotarians online have any happy bucks? It is my pleasure to welcome Courtney Cortolo to introduce our speaker. 
Thank you. So I am really honored to introduce our speaker today. And after reading his bio, there really isn't a better person for the job that he has. So Andrew graduated from Maple Grove High School and has a degree in communications and media arts from Jamestown Community College. He began his career in 2000 as a part-time employee at WJTN and SE93 and has advanced through the Media One radio group in various different positions over the past 22 years. His responsibilities have included being a sports reporter, on-air personality, production voice, music director, program director, operations manager, marketing executive, and now he is the general manager. So he really is the best for the job. So welcome, Andrew. Thank you so much. How to use this thing. Um, well, thank you. It really is an honor to have been uh, invited to be here. Um, where do we start? The, the, the best part about all this is uh, there's a lot of recognizable faces. And I think what's even uh, better is there's a lot of people in the, the room I've never met face to face before because I am so busy. <laughs> I rarely get to leave uh, the station. Um, I do a little bit of everything. So if you have time afterwards, if we've never met face to face, but by email or phone call, please introduce yourself because I've got that radio voice, that shyness uh, factor. I like to stay in my studio. So when I get to go out, I enjoy meeting people. And that's one of the reasons I got into it. Uh, my intention when I got into radio was not to be the general manager, was not, Lord, not to do sales. Uh, it was to entertain people. And uh, it started when I was 14 years old, woke up one morning and my voice changed and that was it. Um, but in 22 years, uh, I've learned a thing or two because uh, I've seen a thing or two. I think that's a commercial. Uh, but our radio stations, and I'm not saying this because I get paid to say this, but you will not find a group of radio stations anywhere in the country like you do in Jamestown, New York. Um, I've had the experience of going to other places around the country and talk to uh, media executives and program directors and not-for-profit leaders. And truly, when they hear about what we've done in Jamestown uh, for almost 100 years, because WJTN will be celebrating our 100th anniversary um, in two years, WJTN is the third oldest radio station in all of Western New York. Um, continuously licensed, continually operating. And that's really something uh, when you look at the population that we have here. And that's only because of the people I know you guys have met before, you know, the Merrill Rosens, the Jim Rosales, the, you know, Doc Websters, the Dennis Websters, the Terry Franks, and a bunch of names that I never had the, the pleasure to meet, the Cy Goldmans of the world. More recently, the Chuck Telfords of the world, you know, who we still miss uh, terribly. And I'm still looking to fill his position. So if anybody knows a good ad executive, we're not just picking anybody. That's big uh, shoes to fill. But our radio stations, um, they really are fantastic. Uh, a lot of you have utilized them, whether it be for your business, to grow your business, uh, for your uh, charity announcements, um, your jobs as part of our, our news coverage. And when I tell you there's a group of people up there that are dedicated, um, that's an understatement. They really are. Uh, and why? Because we love it. One of my great friends, Mr. Roselli said, the day you wake up and you're not excited to go to work is the day you need to find a new job. And there's a reason I've been where I've been for 22 years. Um, I love it. Uh, don't shy away from uh, the opportunity to meet people, help people. And that's what radio is all about. Yeah, there's that entertainment part. But what makes local radio different in 2022, especially coming out of the pandemic like we have, it's because of this. It's because of the localism that we haven't lost. And it's being able to meet you folks and, and shake hands and, and do the emails and speak at rotary meetings. When you go to other corporate you know, uh, entities in the, the advertising world, you don't have that connection. And that's what makes local radio special. Yes, uh, is uh, the world different than it was you know, three years ago? Absolutely. 20 years ago, yes, there was a time where TV was supposed to kill the radio star. It didn't happen. Then this thing, the internet was supposed to kill radio. It didn't happen. And then there's the satellite. It didn't happen. And that's because of the people that you have met in your careers that have worked specifically at our radio stations. 
Uh, we've gone from one radio station, WJTN, to two, to three, to four, five, and we're up to six. Uh, the FCC won't let us have any more, and that's probably a good thing because I can't handle any more. Uh, but uh, our variety of programming we continue to do, yes, music, local news, sports, um, you know, uh, happy talk programming, informational talk programming, of course, with Dennis and Terry. Uh, and uh, once in a while, when there's not a pandemic, we get to go out in the world and, and meet our listeners. Uh, and we're uh, happy to be able to do that at some point uh, here soon. Internet, we launched online, so we are streaming all six of our stations finally. Um, it's an undertaking because it's not cheap. Um, and when there's music, you, you hear music and you think, oh, that's great. Music's expensive, <laughs> uh, as uh, some people in the, the room will tell you. Tim Edborg knows a thing or two about that. Uh, music light, uh, rights, so it is, uh, you know, the transmitters that we have, there's a lot of power. God bless the BPU for helping us there. Uh, uh, but uh, it is expensive to run six commercial radio stations. And here's the pitch. The only way we can do that is with advertising support. Uh, I'm not here to pitch you because there's some people that have grown their businesses, um, their organizations, because, you know, we haven't just accepted your, your dollar. We've given you 10 back. Um, our radio stations are very graceful. We're very, very lucky to have the ownership group that we have that wants us to be involved in the community. Um, sometimes when you see radio stations that are corporately owned, it's very greedy, and that is not the case here at all. Uh, if you've ever worked with us, you know we are very... Um, you know, we're, we're, we're very giving because we want this community to succeed and grow because if your businesses, your uh, organizations don't succeed and grow, we can't stay in business. Now, luckily, I can say I've never seen a radio station go out of business. Uh, I've never missed a meal. So radio is, is well in the local community, and it's because of people like you. Um, I can go into the, the boredom of all six stations, who they are, what they do, their transmitter power, their coverage maps. If you want to have a conversation about that some other day, I can. But overall, I can just tell you that the biggest um, opportunity I wanted to come up here is to say thank you, because if it weren't for uh, you folks and your friends and neighbors, the radio stations wouldn't be as successful as they are today. And uh, I appreciate your time. Right up to my face. Okay. Um, what is the most popular show on any of your stations and how many people listen to it? Great question. Um, geographically, SC 93, 93 is the most powerful radio stations in Southwestern New York. Uh, our transmitter is 26,500 watts. And even though I'm not legally uh, supposed to tell you this, because of the elevation that they put our tower at, we broadcast much more than that. Um, but that is Nielsen has identified that that is the most popular radio station, most listened to radio station. Um, this Nielsen guy we talk about, it's uh, the same people that tell you how many people watch the Super Bowl or how many people were exposed to a certain ad. Um, they're the largest uh, company in the world that does this type of data collection. And we've subscribed to it over the last five years. We've never had to subscribe to it before. But the reason we did is because of the growth of the Internet and because of marketers who are starting to do their own research. And unfortunately, I don't know if you guys know this, but you can't trust everything you read on the internet. And that includes how to market your business. Um, there's a lot of experts out there that do blogs and think they, they know how it works. The, our favorite is, well, I tried radio once, it doesn't work. Well, your message was wrong, you had the wrong ad exec, you didn't give it enough time, there's tons of reasons. So we got the research and the data so we can kind of prove it. Here's how many we have. And we estimate with Nielsen support, I can't make this up because we are um, governed by the FCC and licensed, but if you take all six of our stations in any given quarter hour, we have about 20,000 people. So about one in four, 20% of the, the population. That's just of Chautauqua County. That doesn't count Warren County. As a lifelong resident of this city or community, um, I know how many young people were brought up in your radio station and given great training, do you still do that? Do you still have young interns and associates coming in and helping? We do, and uh, that's something I actually take pride in because that's, uh, I have to do all that. So every year I do get an intern from at least one through the New York State Broadcasters Association. Um, we've been doing this internship since, mm, I'd say 2004 maybe. 
So almost every year we've had one, but we've also partnered with JCC, SUNY Fredonia. In the summertime, when students come from other parts of the country uh, back home, we give them uh, opportunities. And it's not just about getting to broadcasting because it's very competitive, um, but it's just giving them life experience. I mean, talking to the individuals and they get a kick out of seeing, you know, our unique personalities that work there. And uh, for those that know any of our personalities, we have some unique ones. Uh, and what it does is it gives them an opportunity in a training when they go back into the real world to learn to get along and, you know, work with uh, people with different ideas and, uh, you know. Yeah, Haley was fantastic. Do you know, I, I taught Haley and the other intern, Melissa at the time, how to make coffee. I said, I go, listen, I said, there's one thing you need to know for this internship. This is the coffee room. This is, have you ever made coffee? No, and I believe Haley was maybe working half time at the Anthony on that summer too. And I said, well, you better learn. So I, I, I remember that. I literally taught her how to make a pot of coffee. Speaking of um, interns, what about your son? <laughs> you... If you those... ask my wife, she says no. Yeah, if you, if you yep. haven't heard him, you... His son is what in high school? Yeah, Tyler turned 16 two weeks ago, and he's been doing some stuff on the radio for the last three years. He has a wonderful voice. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's on all of them. He does. He does commercials right now. If you hear the Tom Ames Ames Insurance commercial, he does that one. He's done some for the BPU, and um, he does a little bit here or there. And for a career, we told him if you want to do broadcasting, go for it. But luckily for us, he wants to be a contractor. <laughs> so. Can you explain a little bit about how do you keep track so that every single song that's played gets the royalty that goes back? How mm -hmm. do you do that? Well, thankfully, we don't have to write them all down anymore. Back in the Jim Roselli era, we literally would have to write down every single song we played, the title of the song, the artist, and if we knew who the record label was, we'd have to write that down, too. Luckily, this thing called the computer uh, helps us out a lot with that now. So uh, the music royalties, we're talking hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of radio stations, thousands across the world. So what you can do now is an option. That if you're a news talk station, you only play X amount of songs per hour. So you're classified as a talk station. Then you have to identify each of those specific songs. Otherwise, we can do what's called a blanket. Um, license, where we say this is our wattage, this is how many people we estimate to receive, and then they calculate it with all these pennies, you know, millions of a pennies, which totals up to that check I have to sign every month and send to ASCAP and BMI and CSAC and Global Media Partners. And then they're responsible for divvying it out. And then we get audited uh, at least once a year where we have to actually send a music log that uh, shows every single song that we played, when we played it, and then they do their mathematical stuff to pay these artists a lot of money. And what a lot of radio stations our size are seeing is these artists, um, I don't wanna say they're getting greedy because I know they have agents to pay. I know they have bills to pay too, but they, they want more and more money. So when you look at radio stations, you know, the size of a Jamestown, New York market, um, that, it totals up, it really adds up. <laughs> I, depends. Is there a song you don't like? Because, no. Well, we, 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 honest to God, we go off of safe lists. Um, it used to be back in the 70s, 80s, you would get, uh, artists would submit their songs directly to you. So radio stations would have music directors. Uh, somebody who was on payroll, their full-time job was to contact all these record companies, get individual, you know, discs uh, sent to them. Do you like the song? And then if you do like it, report it back. We don't do much of that anymore. Um, and that's, uh, you see a lot of the independent radio stations um, that do that. So locally, I'd say WRFA, fantastic community radio station. We're very lucky to have it. They can do some of the artist spotlights where they get some of those independent artists that want to kind of break through. Um, we try not to do that on a local level because it's like if you give a mouse a cookie, uh, you know, we know how that goes. And there are there are a lot of people who think they can play guitar and think they can sing with the guitar. And I can tell you they can't. And, and, and I'm not that person to say to crush somebody's dreams. So we have a blanket um, uh, uh, safe list to say, this is what we go off of. The 
George Carlin's seven di uh, dirty words are real. Uh, they're not a lot on the radio station. I will tell you what you're seeing now more and more is, is I'm probably one of the youngest people here, if not the youngest. Uh, even I'm starting to not like today's music. Um, it's changed a lot. The artists have changed, you know, and being a father too, but not to say it's not uh, catchy, um, it's commercialized, but when it comes down to the swearing, no, you cannot swear on the radio. It's, they become a little more lenient with some of those words um, that we were told, you know, as kids growing up, don't you dare say that. Now you hear them in almost every song. But when it comes down to the big dirty, uh, seven uh, dirty words, no. No, not allowed, and, and I don't anticipate that would ever be allowed. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, for how many years does a song have to be out uh, after it's published before you no longer have to pay royalties on it? The, so the public domain uh, on songs, I think some of them now are going back to the 20s and 30s, uh, as simple as the Happy Birthday song. Yeah, yeah, it's... It's going back a long time and the cataloging of them. So, um, you know, some of those songs, yeah, I mean, they, they have royalties. And even though they're long and gone, they have an estate that still collects on those royalties. I mean, the estate of uh, Prince, the estate of uh, any, you know, Aretha Franklin, I mean, you name it, those families are, are still getting money. They get a check every single month from the, the music companies. Even uh, who did Silver Bells? Come on, Walt, who did Silver Bells? That well, no, who wrote it? From Silver Creek. Is that who wrote it? Lives in Silver, or lived in Silver Creek. Yeah. He wrote, was, he wrote Silver Bells, right? Yeah. So that family is still getting checks. Okay. Sell uh, maker. I'm Sorry. so old that I can remember the Dunnigans. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I also remember fondly the breakfast party. Now, one thing about having local radio is it connects to the local community and helps the local community connect to the rest of the local community. Uh, the Dungunigans are long gone, but, but the breakfast club by the party is not on either anymore, I guess. And any thoughts about trying to give that up again or get it going again, or is it really a thing that's just in the past? No, one of the things is, as long as I'm at the radio station, any uh, what we call traditional or heritage programming, we want to continue. Uh, example times of your life. You know, uh, uh, when uh, Mr. Roselli passed away, uh, I quickly, you know, made connection with Russ and said, let's do it. And we continue to do it. Breakfast party, we had to stop, obviously, because of the COVID. The last broadcast was right here. We were in friendlies for so long. And before that, you know, the Main Street Deli, I mean, we were down. And so this is the last place. It's the perfect place. Um, Dennis has, I don't want to speak on Dennis's behalf, but uh, Dennis kind of wants to pass that torch along. So it's a matter of us finding the right people to do it, because if you've ever been to the breakfast party, it's not just one person. There is a team um, to make that work. And you have to have content. You have to have programming available that interests folks to come and be a part of it. So we don't just show up and put on a radio show for an hour uninterrupted, you know, as the longest running live audience participation program in the country, which it was up until it ended. And when, not if, but when we can bring it back, it will continue to do so. Just like high school bowl. High School Bowl, uh, 62nd year this year. Uh, the longest running, again, we had to take a little uh, stop there for pandemic, but uh, Dennis starts recording the shows in two weeks uh, at JCC. We are looking for sponsors um, because there's a big undertaking there where he, he gets the questions together and we keep that heritage programming going. So I think it's very important, like uh, you know, Dr. Jones said, staying in the you know, local community, um, that's how you do it. It's being able to do things like this, not hide behind a microphone as much as I'd love to. Like Greg Jones, uh, I am the oldest person here. <laughs> I'm not kissing your cheek. I got to know friends with Cy Goldman mm. and uh, the, the stations were a client of ours back when we were in business and uh, every month I had to get the fee from Cy Goldman he made me pick up his laundry down at Esquire <laughs> Cleaner. <laughs> I believe it I never got to meet Cy he had passed away before I got into it but I've never heard anything short of a fantastic story from him and really a radio a radio pioneer this this town's was very lucky to have the, the, the roster of people 
on the air and behind the scenes that we've had over the last 100 years. Thank you, Andrew, for coming in and presenting us to us this afternoon. One of Rotary's major international programs is to eradicate polio in the world. In honor and thanks for your presentation to our Rotary Club today, we'll make a donation in your name that will vaccinate four children who will never experience polio in their life. Remember this year's international Rotary theme, Imagine Rotary. Thank you, and we are adjourned.